Chair calls Dr. Spelling. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. Uh, I hope you can see the slides uh, on your screen as well. Uh, it's terrific to be with you today. I'm sorry, a longstanding commitment uh, keeps me from being there in person. I'm particularly pleased to follow Commissioner Morath, who uh, I think is the best commissioner in the in this country because of his uh, urgent focus on student achievement and his strong support for uh, enhancing student achievement through sound measurement and accountability. During my decades long career, I've had the privilege of working in service to many critical players in public education, including the Texas legislature and Texas governor on behalf of Texas school boards and at the federal level leading the United States Department of Education. It's been fascinating to be a party to the calibration and recalibration of the roles these various actors play as we work to serve students, taxpayers, and communities. What I've learned sometimes at the School of Hard Knocks could fill volumes, but I wanna focus on a few key points about assessment today. Oh, I've gotta get my slides going here. There you go. Um, our economy relies on state talent to meet its workforce needs. We need to develop our own Texas students so that they can be part of the economy for decades in the future. That requires knowing how students and schools are doing so we can make smart investments. As I like to say, we need to care enough to find out how all students are doing. With this information, we as state policymakers can and must set priorities, allocate resources, and convey needs and challenges to parents and taxpayers. For those who wanna measure what matters, whatever that means, I ask them what matters more than a student learning, reading, and doing math on grade level. How will we make the case for further and righteous investments when we cannot demonstrate clearly where we lead and where we lag? Why would taxpayers support funds for reading academies, for example, without the data that demonstrates a need? As I like to say, if there's no problem, we don't need a solution. And without assessment, we lack the ability to make the case for parent empowerment through charters or the need to reward teachers who take on the hardest work in schools who need them most. At this juncture, it's probably helpful to do a little table setting with a history lesson about Texas and its assessment system. Our work, like many states, was spurred in the aftermath of the Nation at Risk report, sadly quite relevant even today, nearly 40 years later. Prior to that report, states had nearly meaningless testing in reading and math, and in Texas, that was the TABS test, or the Texas Assessment of Basic Skills. It measured quite low levels of educational attainment and aggregated data of all students together. We could tell ourselves that those in the middle of the pack were doing okay, when in truth, many children were being left behind. TABS didn't tell us much since the test was only given in the third, fifth, and ninth grades. In 1984, in response to the Nation at Risk report and the work of the Perot Commission, Texas expanded to annual assessment in reading and math and began to disaggregate data so we could have a clearer picture to better apply resources and solutions and understand the needs of every child and every unique population of students. But that test, called TEAMS, was ultimately too easy, and over time it became less useful. Essentially, we tapped out. Imagine you're training for a 10K. You know you'll ultimately need to run about six miles, but you don't start there. You start with a mile, get good at it, and continue to add distance. I know this is a silly and simple analogy, but when you, we think about it, what we're collectively trying to do is move a large and complex enterprise forward over time while keeping political, taxpayer, parent, and educator support. A system that's too hard or too easy undermines confidence by all. Imagine, uh, okay, back to history, sorry. Uh, with each new test, first toss, then tax, then star, we raise the bar to ask more of our students and better capture the needs of our economy and workforce more accurately and responds to improvements in te testing itself to create a system that was understood to be achievable and supportable. Until STAR, Texas had a history of pretty low standards. With STAR, we're asking more of students and teachers to truly ready our young people for the world that they will face. The truth is, adjusting and modifying our system of measurements has happened many times over the years. In fact, you all have allocated $70 million to upgrade these tests to help guide our $70 billion public education system. And you've just heard from the commissioner about improvements that can be made now. That's appropriate and natural. 
but we must stay true to the need and centrality of these measures with the twin goals of stretching the system to better meet the needs of students in the economy and keeping the political oars in the water so we can row the boat forward with needed taxpayer and institutional support. As you know, in 2001, No Child Left Behind was enacted at the federal level. This law was in no small part based on the improvements, especially for our neediest students, that Texas was showing using these sound principles. Here's a look at the data from that period with tex in Texas with all due credit given to those in classrooms at that time. These were the days when leaders from around the nation were looking to us to show the way for enhanced student achievement. The federal law, which I was privileged to help implement, required states to develop, often for the first time, annual assessment in reading and math and once in high school and report that, uh, report that data in a disaggregated fashion. It required states develop and the feds approve systems that had alignment between the curriculum standards. That is what we wanted students to know and do and measure against those standards. It required all states to participate in the NAEP to serve as a check on the quality of state systems overall in exchange for billions of dollars invested at the federal level. I mention this because strong alignment between curriculum and measurement help illustrate my next point, and that is that good design of tests and the accountability systems that flow from them <coughs> matter a lot. As people who care about public education, we care about every child's learning. The only way we can understand how much a student is learning is through assessment. The legislature also needs good information that is valid, reliable, fair, and comparable to make good policy decisions for, for students. The STAR exam meets all these criteria. They are valid, reliable, fair, and comparable exams. They're also an improved part of our plan under ESSA. For example, the STAR given one year is comparable to a test given the prior year. And if that isn't enough, in Texas, we release the test items so parents, teachers, and others have faith that the test is measuring what we want students to know, and which increases our cost since new test items have to be created every year. Test items are typically field tested before they can be incorporated into the exam that will be used. None of this happens, as you have heard, without the work of hundreds of teachers and thousands of hours who design the standards, help design the standards, and develop the tests. It's also worth noting what does not pass for good design. First, these are terms only psychometric experts can discern and endorse, not me, not you, not your average superintendent. In addition, things like parent surveys or extracurricular participation do not constitute valid or reliable measures, while they may be useful for other purposes. Tech-based curriculum offerings that monitor progress along the way also are useful, but they are not a substitute for valid, reliable, and sound measures. Great care should be taken as we think about through-year or rolling assessments. While potentially useful, we must ensure that these meet the same validity, reliability, fairness, and comparability features. Florida, for example, is beginning to implement a new law that would add this type of assessment to its existing summative system, but know that this is more, not less, testing. The STAR exam is a strong assessment in large part because of the incredible work of Texas teachers who review the exam. Each STAR question is reviewed by 16 to 20 teachers, meaning that every year over 3,000 hours are spent reviewing and editing STAR questions. The redesign has also made taken significant teacher involvement with over 5,000 teacher hours spent on making the STAR more closely mirror classroom experiences. This slide is an example of this principle. The standards on the left side are written by a team of teachers, parents, and business leaders, then approved by the SBOE. These standards are then tested on the STAR exam. If the test is well designed, teaching to it, if that is covering the material that will be measured on the test, is not educationally unsound, but of course, kill and drill can overdo it. That's why curricular rigor and great materials help teachers stay focused on student achievement over time over test taking strategies. When Texas held true to a philosophy that embraces what gets measured gets done, coupled with resources for reforms that work, we move the needle for students. This approach bore fruit in the early 2000s, as you can see from this slide. Sadly, and around the time of the financial crisis, our progress slowed dramatically. There was more flex and less muscle in the accountability system, more fine print that was authorized by the feds 
and could be, be manipulated to paint a rosier picture of our schools that mask the underperformance of students. During my days as secretary, Texas had some of the highest special education exemption rates in the country. In short, we took our foot off the gas. But happily, with House Bill 3, motivated by the significant declines in Texas student achievement that preceded the new law, coupled with a realization that st other states were pulling ahead and making faster progress, Texas is back on track. I think we're all pleased with the recent star results, especially in light of COVID, but we certainly have more to do. Like you, I believe our, sh our state's number one asset is our people. Today, we're falling woefully short of meeting the needs of students and families and ultimately the needs of our state and its growing economy. Texas has enjoyed economic growth because we've attracted talented people from other places, but we must do better by our own students. Over the past several sessions, this body has taken significant steps to strengthen our assessment and accountability system. To aid this work, you've invested heavily in public schools through House Bill 3, and I urge you to hold the line on these reforms and continue the great work you have started. Without the measurement and data that assessment brings, coupled with the motivation, incentive, and yes, enforcement of strong accountability, we can and have fallen behind. If ever there was a time to stay true to the principle of caring enough to find out all we can through th strong assessment and accountability systems, this is it. Thank you very much.